Hello, my dear listeners, Barry Kibrick here, and welcome to Thoughts Through Time. In this episode, we explore the words and thoughts of Lao Tzu from his writings of the Tao Jing, better known simply as the Tao. Written over 2,000 years ago, uh, circa 500 BC, the Tao is a true classic of spiritual and philosophical thought. It was created as a guide to living a life of peace, serenity, and compassion, and it affords us the same opportunity to do so today, 2,500 years later. Many refer to the Tao as the way of integrity, or simply the way. It was designed to provide a path for all mankind to live in harmony with their surroundings and to also be in tune with the workings of the universe to the best of their ability and especially to seek out the role we play in it all. There's been much discussed about who really authored the Tao, but credit is almost always associated with Lao Tzu, whose name means Old Master. He was called that because he was the elder sage of Confucius himself, and he was the one responsible for keeping his archival records. The Tao was one of the first Eastern philosophies to be embraced by the West. Eastern philosophy is centered around the concept of unity or collectivism, while Western philosophy, that's centered more around the idea of individualism. Both, however, are always searching for the meaning of life and how to live as good a life as possible. What I found so astounding, especially within the era of the Tao, is that at the same time it exists, so does Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and the Old Testament, all written between the mid-6th and 5th century BC. In fact, in the arc of history, this is as close to simultaneously as it gets. When and why this occurs, I like to view as as a way of tapping into what I call the cosmic library. Great thinkers and their thoughts I envision are stored there, checked out, and shared in some yet unknown way. Maybe, in a sense, it's the ultimate result of a common consciousness. But let me give you a perfect example that occurred within the Tao and the Old Testament. The following verse was taken directly from Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. There is a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, and a time for war and a time for peace. Now, Listen carefully to the words from verse 29 of the Tao. There is a time for being ahead, a time for being behind, a time for being in motion, a time for being at rest, a time for being vigorous, a time for being exhausted, a time for being safe, a time for being in danger. (laughs) To me, this is absolutely astonishing. They are written so close in time, yet in such distant lands. So was there a cosmic meeting of great minds? Were they tapping into that cosmic library? 
I gotta admit, I really have no idea why these two are so eerily and yet so very pleasantly connected. And I've got to admit, I enjoy when this happens, and it happens quite often throughout history. Think of it for a moment. Times like the Renaissance, the Enlightenment period, and others throughout the ages when great thoughts seem to congeal and come together. Now, the Tao is 81 verses long, and it is written more in a poetic manner than in a manner of prose. Most view it as a form of philosophy at its core, but with a deep and a profound mysticism surrounding its message. Now, mysticism, it's often associated as becoming one with God, or as some people say, the absolute. But many also refer to it as uh, an altered state of consciousness, you might say. It may also refer to the attainment of insight in ultimate or hidden truths. You can look at it in any way that suits your own personal beliefs. Philosophy, we know that's really the definition is a love for wisdom. It is the quest, the quest to seek fundamental truths about ourselves, about the world, and even about the relationship between the two. It studies the underlying nature of knowledge, reality, and to the best of its ability, existence itself. Now, with the Tao combining the two, it offers us a way of dealing with life on almost any level imaginable. Plus, and this is what I find most interesting, it allows us to interplay between the text and ourselves, between the reader and the text, because due to the variety of ways it can be interpreted, it gives us the opportunity to read into it what we feel like getting out of it, and yet at the same time, it explains to us what it wants us to receive. The Tao also shows us how we might see things if we could spend more time in awareness and less in trying to figure out what we need to be aware of. I find that Uh, a key to this because we are oftentimes thinking just about what are we supposed to be aware of? It says, don't worry about that. Stop figuring it out. Just live in what they call the awareness. You'll see this kind of opposites and contradictions as we go forward, but they play a major role in why the Tao still is with us to this day. And we see it in the first few lines of the first verse. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. Now, the name that cannot be named was the first thought that really piqued my interest when I started reading the Tao. For it harks back, once again, to the Old Testament, where the name of God is never written out. In fact, it is only two unpronounceable vowels the way it is written in the first five books of Moses, known as the Torah. The reason for this, as in the Tao, is that it was believed the awe of it all would diminish in some sense if it could actually be named, and it would also take away from the astonishment, the wonder, and the potential awareness of the mystery of life and creation itself. Now, the notion of opposites also play a major role 
and is one of the most common threads of thought in the Tao. This concept of duality, known as yin and yang, which is the way they express it in most Eastern philosophies, this plays out in many verses because the message is so important, Lao Tzu believed it needed to be repeated and it needed to be repeated often. Lao Tzu uses it to describe how seemingly opposite or contrary forces are complementary. Here is a classic example from verse 2. Being and non-being create each other. Difficult and easy support each other. Long and short define each other. High and low depend on each other. Before and after follow each other. You see, the Tao sees a complete unity within opposites. And when combined, these two diverse forces, they form a whole that, according to Lao Tzu, is completely interconnected. Now, the old master Lao Tzu wants us to also contemplate these opposites, because when we do, they actually can act sort of as a form of meditation. And and how that works is by keeping our mind centered and paying attention to the opposites, we're, in a sense, balanced. We're able to shun many of the things that run through our mind on a moment-to-moment basis. And if you are deep in thought in regards to being and non-being, just the mystery of that alone allows you to see there is really, there's nowhere for your mind to really roam. Another recurring theme in the Tao is how often and the variety of ways Lao Tzu uses the meaning of center. One way, it's, like we all know, it's the middle ground of the opposites. Another way as to be centered is a way to compose oneself when under duress. And he also uses it sort of as a space holder, a space that may seem empty, but contains a force nonetheless. Here's how he phrases it in the Tao. We join spokes together in a wheel, but it is the center hole that makes the wagon move. We shape clay into a pot, but it is the emptiness inside that holds whatever we want. We hammer wood for a house, but it is the inner space that makes it livable. We work with being, but non-being is what we use. Again, we end this concept of being and non-being. And I must admit, grasping the concept of being and non-being, that was very difficult for me. I really wanted to understand this at the deepest level possible and had to do some research until I came around and found someone who did just that in a way that made sense to me. His name is Chuck Gillion, and every day he posts about the Tao on his blog, The Libertarian Taoist, Now, here's what's so funny. Chuck lives in the Ozarks of Missouri. Now, that's about as far as you can get from Eastern philosophy and the Eastern part of the world as there is. But while smoking his pipe in his backyard and observing nature, this in his unique Western libertarian and Taoist perspective, he gives us an imagery of non-being. Chuck says, and these are his words, 
There is value in emptiness. It is the emptiness, the nothing, the non-being that creates value for everything around us, everything we even work with. Hold on to the center, that emptiness inside. That is how we will come to practice knowing, not knowing, and doing, not doing. That is how to get off the crazy path we have been on for our whole lives and follow the path to serenity. Now, when he said that last line, that's when I believe he got it right. When he brings it all back to serenity. Because remember, that is what the Tao is striving for us to reach. A, a place, a, a, a space that's filled only with tranquility and deep understanding. And here's the catch. When we stretch ourselves to deal with these concepts we have an opportunity to see things that we may have missed. And that especially goes for the concept of non-being. Even that can be viewed as the energy present in inner space as well as in outer space, the energy that holds things together. Consider it like this for a moment. In physics, they call it oftentimes dark matter and dark energy. And in fact, just a few years back, it was really called a void. But now we know there is no such thing as a void, just energy and matter that we cannot detect not with the naked eye, and oftentimes not with any even scientific instruments. But we know there really is no nothingness. But the unseen energy is what keeps everything moving and also keeps all things together. All these forces, unseen, but ever-present, and, more importantly, essential for all of life and existence. You see, it gives us room to contemplate and it forces upon us a calmness. With that calmness, we develop less anxiety and can act properly, even under the most dire of circumstances. Now, one of the greatest things about being human happens to also be one of the toughest issues we deal with on a regular basis. We have unlimited options. Now, this can make it very difficult for us to choose a proper path. But at the same time, it also makes room for us to become passionate about an array of possibilities. Lao Tzu was aware of this, and in the Tao, he expresses it like this. The Tao is like a well, used but never used up, filled with infinite possibilities. It is hidden, but always present. I don't know, but that powerful concept of infinite possibilities that are never used up, even if they are hidden, we know they are always there. It's one of those things that can liberate us in so many ways. It Personally, it allows me to take it a little easier on myself when I realize that that well won't run dry. You see, we are often blinded by our own insecurities and chances that we haven't taken. You know, study after study reveals, and, and this is very important, 
it reveals that most humans have regret, not because they did something and failed, but because they failed to do something. The Tao wants us to know that even if we cannot see them for ourselves, the possibilities are still always present. And all we need to do, all we need is just to go to the well. Go to it as often as you like, because you never have to fear that you will use up the wealth or water within. And Lao Tzu sends this message home by placing us as an essential part of existence. See the world as yourself. Have faith in the way things are. Love the world as yourself. Then you can care for all things. Now, just ponder those words for a moment. See the world as yourself. Have faith in the way things are. Love the world as yourself. Then you can care for all things. This verse is all about how we see our role in the world. And when we realize that the self and the world are one and we emphasize the important role that even a single mortal has within the whole, that's when we begin to feel the connection that enriches our lives. When we have a sense that matters will work themselves out, it allows us the freedom and opportunity to experiment more with our own ideas and our own images of what we are meant to be. But a deep question remains, why? Why did Lao Tzu want to express such thoughts in the first place? Why did he believe it was important for all humankind to be made aware in such a manner? I've been giving it a lot of thought, and I believe it boils down to a deep desire to find the connectivity of existence. And Lao Tzu gives us that within the Tao when he expresses this quest in the following verse. A good traveler has no fixed plans and is not intent upon arriving. A good artist lets his intuition lead him wherever it wants a good scientist has freed himself of concepts and keeps his mind open to what is. Look at this as the difference between a journey and a quest. A journey, it has a destination. But a quest, it's a little different. A quest is a mission to find out, to find a purpose or a truth. And it really has no beginning or an end. And when we free ourselves from an end point, that's when we discover so much about our world and ourselves. Lao Tzu makes it clear with these words, near the very end of the Tao. Failure is an opportunity. So my dear listeners, never fear failure. Embrace it. Seize the opportunity that it offers and do so with joy rather 
than trepidation. I'm Barry Kibrick. Combine that message of embracing failure with the peace and serenity offered in the reading of the Tao, and you have a winning combination. Thank you all for joining me today. I really appreciate you listening, and please share this with others who might benefit by the wisdom of the Tao. Actually, that would mean sharing it with everyone on the planet, because the wisdom of the Tao will benefit everyone. And a very, very, very special thanks to my wonderful patrons who make this podcast possible. If you enjoy Thoughts Through Time and want to become a patron, you can do so by visiting my website, barrykibrick.com. It's also a way for you to get in touch with me if that interests you as well. On the next episode, join me as we appreciate the great thoughts and words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. from his earliest writings in the 1950s to rarely before heard speeches. His wisdom is truly for the ages, and we could especially use it today.